maybe. So everyone, um, I know some of you uh, personally uh, through the course, and 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 uh, so I'm glad to see you uh, joining us. Uh, Reverend Sugahara mentioned that I I I had never experienced drop off or drop falling down. That's not true. He doesn't know me. <laughs> you know, uh, I grew up in a house that where my parents were always fighting and and very difficult childhood. Um, that's probably the reason why I'm in Buddhism. Uh, and then I came from Japan at the age of ten to a new country. I had to learn English and. And I even had uh, at the Buddhist temple, uh, who is now a friend of mine, who called me FOB, <laughs> and it wasn't quite a welcome. I mean, I think we all go through that. And uh, that's, you know, uh, that's why we have Buddhism. And uh, uh, I know that Buddhism has given me the strength to be, uh, strength and wisdom to be who I am uh, to uh, all this, uh, up till now. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, do a share screen. Okay, so uh, we have two hours and I'm gonna speak for about 40 minutes, uh, the first session, and then we go to question and answer, take a short break and then do another 30, 40 minutes. And um, I wanted to, uh, you know, not end up where I'm just talking all the time. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, during the Q&A, I hope that you can, uh, you know, uh, ask questions or make comments. So, um, as Reverend Sugata said, the title was given to me, and, uh, you know, Amer Americanization of Buddhism, Definition and Prediction. Um, I didn't quite know what it meant by definition, but I took it to mean the status quo, how things are now, and prediction is prediction. But I also wanted to, I added the subtitle, especially as it pertains to Shin Buddhism, because most of us are, are concerned about that. Okay, so the aim of the talk, uh, I will, uh, I have already asked uh, many of you to, uh, most of you who signed up to uh, take a look at uh, the, my book, Jewels, and chapters one and four deal with American Buddhism. So, uh, of course, obviously, I can't speak about everything, uh, cover everything. So uh, you are asked to look at look at that book, um, which is available. And and I, I just told the uh, Reverend Sugahara, reminded him that any institution, Buddhism, you can order from BDK free of charge and they can they'll send you all, all as many books as you want. The more uh, academic part of this, especially with Shinshu, uh, if you uh, uh, look at, I, I would ask you to look at my lecture that I did at IBS uh, uh, 2021, the first uh, Dr. Taitetsu Unno lecture at IBS, and I cover most of the things that I will talk about, uh, especially dealing with doctrine. Okay, so Americanization. I think we can look at it from two perspectives. One is a sociological phenomenon, a phenomena or phenomenon, uh, how Buddhism is growing in America sociologically. And then the latter part, I'm gonna talk about its influence. Okay, so I just had to share this with you. As I, you know, I, I arrived in California the first time in three and a half years uh, to my home in El Cerrito. And as I was taking a walk, I was astonished to find this Zen center right in my neighborhood. And I think this is symbolic. You know, here uh, in the suburbs, right next to Berkeley, um, you know, uh, you have uh, 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 this play. It's about, well, it's, you know, it's not too large, but it, you can see that there, there are mats where people can do meditation and tea ceremony. And it's in the middle of a suburbia. That's, I, an indication that it represents uh, uh, the growth of Buddhism in America. So I want to talk about how Buddhism has grown, and most of you know that, but in terms of numbers, uh, I, I often say that 10% of U.S. population, or close to 33 million people, are connected to Buddhism in some way. So in terms, they're not all Buddhists. 1%, 3.3 million, 
which is a 17 fold growth since 1970. And most of us growing up in the 60s and 70s, we know the percentage of Buddhists at that time. And, but he has grown 17 fold. And in terms of nice stand Buddhists or sympathizers, and these are not, they don't claim to be Buddhists, but they read books at nighttime in their bedroom, and then they put it on their nightstand, the book on the nightstand. That's why a scholar kind of humorously named them nightstand Buddhists. So, but there are about, uh, we estimate uh, 2.7 million. It's hard to gauge. And then finally, uh, in a study that took place in 2003, um, they asked the question, how many, uh, have you been influenced strongly by Buddhism in terms of religion or uh, in terms of uh, religiously or spiritual, spiritually? And approximately what would be equivalent to 27 million people uh, said yes. So if you take all of them, we're talking about 33 million and that's one tenth of the population. That is astonishing, you know. Uh, and I just give you some photos of, uh, that, you know, uh, examples of how Buddhism has uh, has been has impacted American culture. And here is Dalai Lama receiving his gold medal in, I think it was two thousand six. I don't know if you heard the news, but we heard some kind of a. a awkward situation that Dalai Lama uh, got himself into. And I just hope that it doesn't really impact, you know, neg impact Buddhism negatively, because he's the, the probably the, he's almost like a symbol of Buddhism in the world. Uh, Tiger Woods is actually a Buddhist, uh, we are told. Um, and then we know Richard Gere, and there are many, many more famous people who are Buddhists. Uh, when I was growing up in Mountain View, California, in the 19, uh, from late 1950s to 60s, there were nobody like this. And so that this is another indication of a, a growth of Buddhism. Her Steve Jobs, when he was young, and the reason why I show this is that look at his feet, legs. What position is it in? It's in a lotus position. And that is because, at a, I think in his 20s, he had started meditation with a Zen center. And, and here he is later, and he is at his wedding. And, uh, and who, is, who is officiating? It's a Buddhist priest at the uh, San Francisco Zen Center. And here is uh, a, a, a march or a, a demonstration of group, a group of Buddhist priests uh, from various traditions, Theravada, uh, uh, Vipassana, Zen. And this, you can see that they're uh, uh, demonstrating against uh, some of the human rights in Burma and, and even in, in China. This was right before the 2008 uh, 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 Olympics in, in Beijing. And so here is an example of, I, I see it as a, a kind of an example of uh, American Buddhism, uh, where uh, social engagement uh, is emphasized more, uh, in my opinion, than in traditional Asia. So what this all means is, in, in terms of the history of Buddhism, uh, is 2,600 years old. And Buddhism has never gone into uh, Europe or Western country. Um, I always say it's never gone over the Western Wall. Uh, it's always went north and east. And, and now to America, especially America, is a, basically a Western country. And it's the first time that Buddhism has spread amongst the ordinary people, not just the scholars or the, the rulers, but the ordinary people. Um, many have uh, taken interest in, and some have become Bud Buddhists. And so it's the first time in the history of Buddhism when, uh, when uh, uh, okay, well, in the past, as you know, uh, in a Buddhism was, uh, 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 was brought over or brought into new country like in China or in Japan, Korea, by the rulers, 
kings and emperors. And they brought, they imported Buddhism uh, not just for enlightenment, to gain enlightenment, but for advanced technology or efficient way of governing and, or to bring higher culture like art and architecture, etc. And then, you know, uh, there is a kind of a, a usage of Buddhism uh, as a protection for the country. In Japan, I mean, uh, the emperors used the monks to have them chant to protect the country. So uh, it, was known, it was not only for uh, purposes of enlightenment or personal awakening, but it, it had other cultural and political uh, reasons for importing. Now, so I, I, I've talked about Buddhism as a whole. And so now I want to just to say a few words about Shin Buddhism. And in terms of, uh, uh, you know, phenomenon, uh, it's obvious that the, in terms of membership, uh, Buddhist Church of America, for example, is right now at around 10,200 members and perhaps around 35 ministers. Now, oh, this is this probably is half, half of the numbers of that the numbers I was, I was I used was, to. Even, you know, I would say 20, 30 years ago. So there's clearly a decline in, 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 these, in, in these numbers. Same with the uh, Hompa Hongaji Mission of Hawaii, which is now down to about 4,000. So uh, now I have I included in here, um, see, um, some questions that were asked by some of you when you registered, you had some questions. So at appropriate sections, I brought this in uh, uh, to, to respond to the questions. And the one question was, Shin Buddhism is now, nowadays accepted all over US. It's a question mark. And is there any place on which the uh, district with large population? Well, I mean, most of you know this. Um, I mean, uh, pro probably whoever asked this question may be from Japan. Uh, so, uh, you know, the large Shin population is located on the West Coast, and um, there are, uh, uh, of course, centers in, in the Midwest and, and in the, on the East Coast, but uh, there are few uh, members. And so the, the population, but however, I think with the changes, uh, we can, hopefully we can expect um, more uh, people interested in Shin Buddhism. Uh, in other parts beyond the uh, the uh, the West Coast. Okay, now uh, so I talked about the sociological dimension. Now I want to talk about the influence, the cultural and religious influence. And obviously, the first one that I want, to, the first part I wish to focus on is meditation. So there are two forms. One is the traditional meditation uh that is uh promulgated amongst the the three basic traditions which are zen theravada and tibetan forms and uh and and, and then the second form is much more you know uh beyond the traditions but we call it mindfulness meditation and as you know mindfulness meditation is huge i, I i've been so surprised by the 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 growth and the uh, the spread of the of this practice and you see it at uh, IT companies hospitals military and schools uh, my daughter-in-law who teaches in, here in California uh, she teaches first grade and she has uh, the kids do meditation right after lunch you know when they're all you know uh, kind of hyper and get them to settle down. So uh, we know about how the success of mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, which was started by John Kabat-Zinn, who is a more of a, a scientist who also studied Buddhism and developed this program within the medical school at the University of Massachusetts. And they, they have trained you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people and so that's another example of, uh, of, of 
the application of mindfulness. Now, some people, especially some more traditional Buddhists, are critical of mindfulness meditation because it's really stripped it of religious dimension. You know, the people just do meditation and they don't think of their ethical action or karma or the worldview uh, uh, that Buddhists have always uh, adopted. So it's kind of a, a pick, pick and choose and uh, focus on what they're interested in, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And here's an example of, a, uh, I think this is a Rinzai Zen uh, school uh, 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 that was started by uh, Sasaki, uh, Joshu Sasaki. And here's a kind of illustration of what probably my daughter-in-law, when she teaches, we will have see this kind of situation uh, at school. Let's go school, military, hospitals, they're everywhere. And they say that uh, uh, specialists have told us that perhaps the uh, two, see, is it 20 million people um, actually practice some form of meditation. And much of them, uh, is probably Buddhist in nature. Of course, people do yoga, and uh, yo the, I guess yoga can be considered meditation. But um, I, uh, the probably the mindfulness meditation is uh, has greater impact today in terms of meditation. Not so much maybe as a you know exercise. Maybe Reverend Bob can tell us more about it because he's now now into yoga. Uh, okay, so. Um, one question from one of you was, how can an American Buddhism best address anxiety of modern life in a political environment? Well, I would say meditation. I mean, you know, it uh, settles people down, helps them to concentrate. And most of all, uh, I think in, in terms, I myself do some form of meditation. I call it the Nembutsu meditation. And it's a kind of a combination of what I learned in a Thai monastery when I was young, and then Nembutsu, reciting the Nembutsu. But I can say that it's helped me to not so much settle down, I think that hopefully settled, helped me, but mostly to, to be more sensitive to what's going on in my mind. Uh, you know, when I'm getting a little irritated, I can catch it quicker so that I don't yell back at my wife. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's. I think that somehow uh, uh, that's an example of how uh, our mental life can be can be helped uh, through uh, meditation, and hopefully that will uh, enhance our relationship with other people, especially our family, and then and also be more tolerant and accepting of people with different views, and you know, obviously. Uh, in the American political culture right now that we are split into two camps and are, are not uh, willing to listen to each other. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, Buddhism can help you. But the, the problem is always is application. You know, we have, the, we have the ideals. The question is whether people listen and really do. And that applies not only to meditation, but to Buddhism in general, needless to say. Um, okay, so here are some other questions. How does America's adoption of Buddhism compare to culturally to Japan or China's adoption of it? It's popular secularization unique to America. Um, secularization is a kind of a, 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 it has different meanings for different people, but if you mean secularization means less religious, then, as I said earlier, in China and Japan, you know, the emperors and the rulers uh, adopted Buddhism for uh, political and economic and other reasons. So it's a form of secularization. In America, what is different is that obviously the president of the U.S. is not involved in bringing Buddhism to America. But what is interesting is that it's the ordinary people in search of some form of, you know, uh, uh, awakening that they bring Buddhism into America. So it's not the rulers, but it's the ordinary people, the seekers for enlightenment and awakening, or maybe personal growth that 
that's uh, that's pulling Buddhism to America. And um, so if you call, but that that actually is not really secularization. Uh, actually, I would say that the ordinary people seeking to become more, you know, develop wisdom and compassion, that is the that is authentic Buddhism. So in a way, what's going on in America is in a way from a true Buddhist standpoint, better than you know, 10th century Japan or sixth century or fifth, sixth century Japan, where the rulers brought in for other reasons. However, having said that, as earlier I mentioned, for example, in America, uh, people do only mindful mindfulness for therapy, self-growth, help them concentrate more. You know, these kinds of, uh, to satisfy those needs, that's definitely secularizing. You're not really concerned so much about, you know, wisdom and compassion for one's own awakening and awakening of others. So that's one of the, uh, uh, so I would say, that's how I would answer the first one. The second one, this is a question by a, a person from Japan. And uh, in English, I translated, American society is intimately tied to Christianity. So how did Buddhism manage to be accepted? Well, I mean, Buddha, America is a very, amongst the advanced countries compared to Western, Western Europe or Japan or Australia and other places. America is probably most open to religion, much more religious than those advanced countries. So that's why they're in, I think Americans who are interested in Buddhism because it is a, you know, one of the three world religions. But having said so, then why, why Buddhism? Uh, what, what does Buddhism have that Christianity and Judaism have? Well, this is a huge topic, but I, I my view my sense is that Buddhism offers a practice a spiritual practice that is not readily found in Christianity or the monotheistic religions. So again, you know, uh, Americans. You know, one thing I recall when I was still in in the U.S. and I attended a conference of the American teachers, Buddhist teachers. And I found it very interesting that everybody asked me, what's your practice? You know, and, uh, uh, you know, in Jodo Shinshu, we don't have the a practice. So I was kind of uh, uh, lo lost for words, uh, what to say. They don't ask you what denomination or what sect that we, we ask in Japan. That's the first thing people ask, what sect, what, you know, what denomination. But in the U.S., people... When uh, Buddhists of various traditions get together, that's what they ask. So what that means is that they emphasize practice. And practice is something that is not readily available in the Christian and Ju Jewish traditions. And that's been what those who have left the Christian and Jewish traditions have said about what is what 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 attracted them to Buddhism. That is a sense of practice. And a, uh, which is which they could not find in their own uh, uh, tr tradition. So um, I would say that uh, readily, and then you know anyone can start meditation, and and you get some kind of benefits. And so uh, I think that uh, that 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 is the one of the reasons why Buddhism made inroad. If it's just a doctrine. I think Christianity and Judaism have their, you know, tremendous, you know, uh, 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 com complex doctrine. But that's not what people are looking for. People are looking for what it means to me in our everyday life. And, and again, I'll be talking more about spirituality later. I think that the sense of religion is changing throughout the world. It's not no longer believing in some deity, but it's much more how we transform ourselves uh, to cultivate, you know, certain values to deal with the, the, the ups and downs of life. So do you see Western culture influencing Buddhism when Buddhism enters Western culture? If so, what changes do you see? Well, 
this is often said a lot. I think earlier you saw that photo on the Golden Gate Bridge, but uh, many Buddhist priests marching to protest the human uh, human rights abuses in China and and Burma. That kind of a uh, 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 social engagement, social protest is much stronger, relatively speaking, than in traditional Asia. So uh, I think that this is definitely an impact of, of uh, influence of um, the Western religious traditions, you know, the sense of justice and, 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 and the notion that you can change the system, which is a very much, much more of a Western cultural value than what you find in, in Asia. Okay, so uh, now, I want to uh, see. I thought I did the 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 timer and I lost it. So, um, can you tell me how much? Uh, what time is it, Reverend Sugara? Okay. Well, you, I I lost track of time here. Okay. So uh, I want to call. Uh, set, what is it? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Okay. So we have about uh, 15 more minutes uh, for until the, okay. But I think we're on, on track. Okay, so uh, we talked about the impact, we're talking about impact of Buddhism in American culture or religious life and focused on meditation practice. The second point, which is probably not as prevalent or you know, obvious, but I think, what uh, Buddhism has done is to uh, provide a new insight uh, into to things, especially death, impermanence, and dealing with setbacks. And I'll cite some examples culturally from uh, contemporary culture or events that will show that uh, Buddhism provides a certain attitude towards death, and impermanence, that was not available in traditional American culture. And so people have turned to Buddhism to find some more meaning, some meaning in this. Okay. All right, so uh, Bill Moyers, as many of you know, PBS uh, series, uh, he did a series back in 2000. And I remember this kind of well, and he, he it dealt with a special program called On Our Own Terms, Moyers on Dying. So death and dying, there was a very important series. And what they, and, and he began this series of four um, uh, sessions on this by going to San Francisco Zen Hospice Project. And there, uh, Frank Ostaseski, who is uh, the director, he was interviewed. And I find it very interesting that, you know, uh, he began this series by going to, a, you know, a director of the Zen hospice. And because I think that Buddhism offers an attitude toward death that is different uh, and not as uh, evident in, a, uh, uh, you know, traditional Amer American culture. So just to quote, uh, he says, when the interview says, uh, it's more in, uh, about death. It's more an issue of relationships, my relationship with myself, with those I love, my relationship with the suffering of death. Well, it doesn't go into depth here, but again, there's a different attitude toward death and that death is not a failure. It's a natural process, which I think an, uh, a value that Buddhism can provide. Here is um, uh, Leo Bascaglia. Who is uh, who wrote the book? Uh, he is a was a professor at Southern University of Southern California, and and uh, he wrote that famous book called The Fall of Freddie the Leaf. And um, actually, I found out that uh, you know when I first read this book, I said, "Gee, you know this famous American uh, a book uh, written by an American professor who is a Catholic." I said, "This feels more like Buddhism." You know, it talks about impermanence and going back to uh, you know the great life, uh, and 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 then I I found out in the course of my research on him that 
actually in midlife, he became interested in Buddhism. He went to Kyoto and lived in the monastery. So I, I said, to my, no wonder this Freddie the Leaf, uh, you know, fall of Freddie the Leaf is seems so Buddhistic. And, you know, here there's that famous line where Freddie says, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of dying to Daniel, you know, his, uh, his buddy who's like, a, who's like the Buddha. And he says, we all fear what we don't know, Freddie. It's natural. And then he goes on to say, you know, we weren't afraid when we went from spring to summer. So, you know, basically be, don't, don't be afraid of what you have not experienced. So again, uh, death is a natural part of natural process. And, and this book sold 5 million copies, at least that I know of. And, and so I think it struck a chord amongst the you know, American readership where death tends to be seen as a kind of a failure almost, and it's unnatural. And that I think there is that, you know, uh, that tendency to see death uh, in that way. And but whereas Buddhism has a, a, a different attitude. Here's more on take on death, which I find very interesting. And this is a famous uh, Steve Jobs speech at Stanford in 2005. And it's now being, you know, looked at as, uh, you know, epitome of a great, short, precise uh, uh, address. And then, you know, at the commencement for, you know, 21 year olds graduating, going out into life, of all things, he talks about what? One of the three things he talks about is death. I mean, I don't think you and hardly anyone would talk about death at a commencement, uh, you know, uh, 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 speech. So he basically says, uh, underlying part, and the details you can read later. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. So in a way, this theme of, you know, by thinking and com com uh, confronting death or uh, not evading, that will enhance the quality of life and the chance that you, chances that you take in what you want to do and not worry about uh, what other people say. And as he says, you are already naked. And I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, this... I think in Buddhism, we often talk about how by knowing death, you understand life better. Or facing death, you appreciate life more. And that theme came through in this famous speech in 2005 at Stanford. And, um, and, and the person who said it is the founder of the iPhone that you know most of the people in the world use these days. Uh, I, I will kind of go through this quickly, um, uh, Mitch Album um, talk in, in this uh, famous book called Tuesdays with Maury, same thing, Maury, the teacher to Mitch, uh, and Maury is dying of, you know, serious illness, and, and he makes a comment, Maury tells Mitch that in order to live fully, we must acknowledge the possibility of death. Uh, this is another, and he, uh, in this book, there's a reference to Buddhism, and how how here there's he talks about Tibetan Buddhists and what they do to remind you of the impermanence of life, and uh, okay. And then this is a famous uh, Phil Jackson, the famous NBA coach, in his book Sacred Hoops. In Buddhism, it is said that by accepting death, we discover how to live. And he ac ac further says, acknowledge uh, lose the possibility of losing then we can fully experience the joy of winning. And here's uh, Phil Jackson, who actually uh, took very, I mean, he was, he was called almost a Zen coach. And I understand a, a minister from Midwest Buddhist Temple in Chicago. He used to come to attend the sun, Sunday service quietly, just come during the service and sit in the back and quietly leave. And uh, so, you know, uh, he, uh, and it shows in what he's what he has said. So here is a you know a, a, a famous person uh, who you know has taken interest in Buddhism, 
and have has focused on on the issue of life and death. So the common themes here: uh, death and setbacks are natural; they're not failures, and facing up to them serves to enhance the quality of life. These are the themes that you see in all the examples that I give you above. Okay, so uh, Shin Buddhist influence. Uh, we talked about, you know, Buddhism in general, but I just wanted to cite uh, uh, one or two uh, influences. And, and one is um, IBS and the Buddhist chaplaincy for the U.S. military. So um, as you know, IBS became a, tra uh, a certified training center or program to produce uh, uh, chaplains, Buddhist chaplains, and it was a first, and it was probably 1990, and the first uh, uh, person to be commissioned as a Buddhist chaplain was a Lieutenant Junior Grade Jeanette Gracie Shin. I find it very ironic and interesting that her name is Shin. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, and then uh, she, she graduated from IBS, the GTO program, and um, and I know that some people uh, were were not so happy about the fact that uh, uh, you know the IBS is involved in ch producing chaplains for military. <laughs> you know the the tension and the the contradiction of you know religion, uh, a chaplain involved in 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 the military. But that's the nature of a uh, you know I mean that's part of American American religion, and in a way. I just thought about it now that it is an example of American Americanization of Buddhism. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, during the Second World War uh, we, uh, in Japan, they they too had uh, uh, chaplains uh, too. Yeah, so uh, I think it's that that's a more of a, a recent phenomenon. Probably it, it could have been influenced by U.S. And the other one, this is a little complex, but I, I, I felt that uh, if there is any impact of Shin Buddhism is this article that some of you probably know, it was published in 2017. It's called In Dark Times, Dirty Hands Can Still Do Good. And here um, the uh, two authors talk about uh, Shin Buddhism and it's a little complex, so I'm, I'll do it very quickly, and you can kind of look at it more in depth. And I have attached, you have been given uh, the entire article uh, that was sent to you, or will be sent to you. So basically, it's about a, a, a lady named Helen who becomes, who's from the Midwest, and she becomes a Tibetan Buddhist. And in order to be a good Tibetan Buddhist, she decides to go to a, an important ceremony in Bhutan. And then, and, and she finds um, uh, that she finds a contradiction that she's trying to, you know, improve the environment and, um, you know, work for the benefit of the, the people who are less uh, advent, uh, uh, less privileged. But here she finds herself flying all the way to Bhutan, and in a in a jet, and you know using up lots of uh, jet uh, jet fuel and harming the environment, and then sitting in chairs that was probably uh, chairs that were created manufactured by people who were not paid very much. So she finds a contradiction, and so I think all of us have the same kind of con feel uh, contradiction of you know, wanting to improve the world in many different ways, but we are also part of it. And, and, and so this article, who do they turn to? They turn to Shinran, and here he says, there are, these contradictions are not, of course, uh, new, new questions, and certainly not new to Buddhist practitioners. They were of great concern to, in particular, to the 13th century Japanese master Shinran. So I found it, uh, I mean, we found it very uh, uh, interesting that uh, these two scholars, actually they're uh, university professors who wrote the article, uh, cite Shinran as someone who can provide a kind of resolution to this conflict or tension of, you know, wanting to do good, yet we are also part of the problem. 
And so uh, Shinran realized, this, these are my words here, Shinran realized, according to these two, that we are all complicit, tainted, and botched, uh, especially spiritually. So, but having said that, I think they're saying that it's important for us to acknowledge that because many of us who do good things for the world, they think that they are purely good and that they tend to be even maybe even self-righteous. They don't realize the fact that they too have participated. But here, uh, Shinran realizes that we do good, but we are also part of the problem. So this tension, uh, uh, lastly, is so uh, the article says not to despair, but to have clarity. To be clear, this admission is not spoken from a place of despair. It is instead a brave realism about the human condition that is clear eyed about the realities of moral and spiritual development. So, um, and then, so I think the point, at least for me, um, this article based on what Shinran is saying, is saying that yes, we are flawed, we are part of the problem, but nevertheless, we should do what we can to improve. Just because we're part of the problem, we don't give up, but it par partake in it. And when we try to be involved to improve the various problems that we're trying to improve, know that and do not be so self-righteous about it, that we are doing good, but to acknowledge that this, this, this tension and to do what we can honestly and and uh, uh, honestly and uh, acknowledge your, your complicity. So on his account, we can both be complicit and hold ourselves responsible for trying to make a difference. Okay, so prediction. Uh, what does the future hold for Buddhism? And obviously this is my uh, perspective and uh, uh, you can, you know, uh, re refute it if you wish, uh, and if you think that is is your position. But here, there's a question that came, and 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 this person says, when I hear the word prediction, I hear the future. And as a Western practitioner born in the 1950s in San Francisco, uh, being in the present moment is what I have read and learned in Buddhist texts. How does predicting in the present moment work in a harmonious way together? Well, uh, I think we're, you know, mixing apples and oranges. You know, uh, I think that predicting is uh, is is more the sociological. We're looking at the sociological phenomenon, or what will the Buddhist uh, phenomenon, what will happen to it, objectively. And here you're talking about living in the moment and present. That is more on a on a spiritual level. So I think uh, they they don't really uh, conflict. They're, you're talking about on two different levels. So uh, I think uh, we can go ahead and and predict uh, sociologically, uh, phenomenologically. And okay. So now uh, I had alluded earlier during the uh, Q and A, so it's good because you know I, I'm kind of reinforcing what I said earlier, that in terms of uh, the future, in in not just Buddhism or Christianity, but religion in general, uh, there are is, is an increase in what they call the religious nons. Nons are people who are not religiously involved. Uh, it could you know, well, anyway, there are different categories within this category. But first of all, uh, according to the Pew's research in to, uh, of the uh, survey done in 2019, uh, those who claim to be Christians have decreased from 91% of the population to 65. Now, that, that is a huge drop, uh, you know, uh, almost 30%. And so uh, that is a fact. And then those who are no longer affiliated with any religion is now 26% overall. But amongst those who are 40 and younger, it's 40%. And uh, 
this, uh, by the way, I think in the 1950s, those who claimed to be not affiliated was really low, like way, like five, you know, even 1%. And so it's gone up and amongst the young people, 40%. So there is also a category called uh, not religious, but spiritual. Many people claim to be this, uh, you know, they're not, they're spiritual, meaning that they're interested in essence of religion or what is called spirituality. And, uh, but they're not interested in a religious organization or institution. So, so we have to define what spirituality is, what is spiritual. And I have used, uh, based on the experts have said, what spirituality is that it's an individual's experience of the sacred. And what is important is one individual is not the family. You know, in Japan, in Buddhism is a more of a, a matter of the family. You belong to a particular tradition, particular denomination. But uh, here we talk about individual and then experience. That's important too. This has to do with that transformation that I talked earlier. Transformation, change. Uh, it's, so, and then the sacred. So, uh, uh, the, this is a, a quick, uh, short definition of spirituality. So, earlier I mentioned that there is a, a fundamental change in the religiosity, uh, in, in of the especially the uh, more quote uh, developed countries, and what they seek in religion. Uh, Professor Wake Roof is a, one, a, a well-known scholar in this field, and I have used this quite often. And he talks about, um, you know, traditional religion by using five terms. They are God, sin, faith, repentance, and morals. Versus what he sees to be the new religiosity, which is emphasis on connectedness, unity peace, harmony, and centeredness. Now, if you looked at this, the meditation that I was referring to earlier that attracts um, uh, many newcomers to Buddhism, you find these terms that are, that are, are uh, connected to meditation. You know, obviously, uh, centeredness is part of, uh, you know, meditation. You find a sense of unity with, those around you and with nature and a sense of connectedness. So there's no talk of God or repentance, uh, which uh, are affiliated or identify with old religiosity. So, um, so if the trend is towards a new religiosity, the kind of Buddhism, general Buddhism, not necessarily Shinshu, Shin Buddhism is more in line with the latter. Buddhism belongs more to the latter. Now, just, just I wasn't going to mention this, but Jodo Shinshu, if you take um, a traditional interpretation of Jodo Shinshu, probably there's more affinity with this old, you know, God would be Amida, faith will be Shinjin, repentance would be a sense of, you know, um, sense of um, self-reflection, which is not a bad thing, but, um, but so Jodo, that, that's, that is a reason why Jodo Shinshu is often, a feel, you know, associated with Christianity. And so uh, we'll address that later. Now, in terms of a positive image about Buddhism in America, um, the study that was done in early 2000 uh, indicated you know, those who felt Buddhism was violent was 12%, fanatical 23 so rather low. But the positives like tolerant, peaceful, are quite high, over 50%. And so, will you welcome the presence of Buddhism? Almost 60% said yes, and that is a good number. So there is a positive image that people in general have of Buddhism. And so that is a... a, a a, a, an, an element or a factor to consider. 
Another thing I, I wish to mention, which is not talked about very much in, uh, uh, in these discussions is I feel that actually in American uh, culture, um, even though it's a, it's a young nation, there has been a tradition of what we call the romantics and the transcendentalist. And you know them by name like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, and Henry Thoreau. And these people uh, talked about some values that are closer to Buddhism, you know, turning more inward, a sense of interconnectedness. And actually, when I was in high school, uh, I was attracted to Henry Thoreau. And, and, uh, and, 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 but I never associated with Buddhism. Um, I didn't know Buddhism that much then either, but uh, somehow I felt an affinity. So what I'm saying is that there is an element in American culture that has affinity to Buddhism uh, in the traditions of transcendentalism and, and, and the romantics. And so that it's that what Buddhism is pointing at is not completely new, you know, and, and so that you have to have that in a culture to bring it in. If it's completely new, people would not be able to even, you know, comprehend. But there is this element of turning inward and uh, a sense of interconnectedness. Okay, so the general outlook on Buddhism is that the conditions favor is more favorable for Buddhism. And there will be increase in the number of so-called nice stand Buddhists. And earlier, you know, these people, they, these, this, these are people who are interested in Buddhism, um, but they may not, they are not inclined to become members of an institution. So we got to figure out, you know, in terms of increasing the influence of Buddhism is how to deal with people like this. And so, and often these people tend to if they affiliate it with an institution at all, it's it's supposedly more like one dimensional. They don't want to become a full fledged member and you know do everything that is required. You know, uh, going out cleaning, you know, do a toban, as they say, and 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 uh, go out to work at the bazaar. You know, and you know these. So they they probably will be more interested in one thing like meditation or social engagement or family counseling and participate in that. So one dimensional mode of affiliation. So how to deal with them from an institutional point. But the overall, uh, I think outlook for Buddhism in general is uh, positive. Now Shin Buddhism, and now we wanna focus on Shin Buddhism. And uh, uh, I think I want, what I, I'm going to emphasize what I think are positive. Uh, Joe just now talked about egalitarian, you know, equality. Um, and, and definitely, I think it's part of this. But I would say the Shin Buddhism uh, has an element of communal and family dimension. And uh, I cite the example of Obon Festival and Dance. I recall going to a temple out in Northern California called Marysville many years ago. And I was astonished. I mean, uh, you know, the temple membership is mostly Japanese American, but most of the people there were not. And they were out there having a great old time. They were really enjoying and they were dancing. And, and I felt that this is something that American culture, uh, you know, seeks. Uh, because you know Americans are much more individualistic and uh, compared to say people in Asia, but but there is a need, and and I think uh, Jodo Shinshu uh, can provide that, and especially because uh, Shinran was you know a family man, and and th this uh, you know all of all of you understand know know this, but uh, actually of uh, I think we need to make greater um, use of the fact, uh, take advantage of the fact that the, our, our founder was a family man. And this is really, you know, uh, uh, quite unique. And, and uh, 
But one thing we cannot forget is that even Shinran is, um, has in, in its background monastic Buddhism. And, and, and so uh, recently I have felt uh, um, more uh, sensitive about the fact that Shinran's Buddhism is really for the layperson. And we've always said that, but I, it, it's become much more clear. But having said that, it's not just popular religion or folk religion, as often Buddhist, Shin has, you know, Shin has been regarded as, oh, it's just a folk religion. No, Shin Buddhism has a text that goes back 2000 years to Sanskrit. And we had Shinran who was a monastic for 20 years. So it's based on that, which is a religion of awakening, religion of transformation. And that, that is why it's not simply a folk religion. Okay, the second point is, you know, I've also talked often about this, that how should Shin Sangha be and the image of a big tent. You know, we have to have a big tent to allow people of various, you know, uh, interests to come in. And I talked about B Buddhists. Do you know B Buddhists? It starts with a B. Basketball Buddhists. Bazaar Buddhists. Bingo Buddhists, um, burial Buddhists, <laughs> people who are interested in having a, a gravesite or some kind of gravesite. So what else? Uh, oh, and there's a board Buddhist. Board members, you know, they like to be affiliated because they like to be, they're interested administratively. Often they're not interested in the spiritual part, but we need people like that. So we have a diverse group of people coming and then it's supported by a center pole that in the past has been eth uh, ethnic in nature. The pole was, was you know, the, its nature was ethnicity. But this, for the future of Shin Buddhism in America, obviously that pole has to change to that of Dharma. And uh, unless you do that, then uh, people who are, who are not, not of Japanese American background will not feel welcome. Some, someone said that uh, finally a, a Shin Buddhism the, uh, will become a, 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 a religious organization, not just uh, social and cultural. Having said that, though, I, wanna, I don't want to be mis, mis, misunderstood. I understand the need for a cultural and ethnic uh, a gathering place in the past. But that is, you know, definitely fading amongst, you know, my, my kids who are fourth or almost fifth generation, they don't necessarily need the temple in the same way. And so, uh, so I've talked about this before, too, that uh, we, have, we have three uh, gener uh, periods, Japanese period from 19 to up to 1944. From 1944 to 2016, the Nisei, the second generation, Japanese American period, and the second and third generation. And then 2016, when baby boomers began to turn 70, I call it the post Japanese American period. So, uh, the, one of the questions that was asked uh, What do you recommend? we do to be part of the spread of Buddhism in America. Also, how do you factor in the different cultural needs as Buddhism expands beyond the Japanese community while also retaining Japanese culture? Um, well, what can you recommend? Well, just spread the word and share the teachings with others in various ways you can and support the temple because without the temple, you cannot really uh, function very well. And so that's obvious. There, are, in terms of culture, um, uh, I think that this will take care of itself. That um, you know, as long as the majority of the members were of a Japanese ancestry, then there is a strong Japanese uh, element. You know, the lunches will be more Japanese. But you know, fifty years from now, I don't think that that will be the case. Having said that. I think the cultural dimension of uh, Shin Buddhism cannot be totally, you know, erased. You know, when you do gasho, you put palms to your hands, the palms together like this. That is, is it religious or cultural? Or bowing 
Is that religious or cultural? I mean, so I think in terms of culture, it will um, take care of itself. It will, it will evolve naturally and to meet the needs of the people. Uh, one good example is that in America, you know, uh, Buddhist temples have taken uh, temples have taken on uh, bingo games as a source of funding, right? And and so uh, that is a uh, not found in Japan, but you know, it's 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 an element, a part of American culture, and 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 so uh, uh, things like that will you know, and already you know, Jodo Shinshu in America is different from. Uh, that uh, in Japan. One good example I was, was going to mention later is that during Ohigan time, what do the, our ministers told us? We practice the six paramitas. Okay. Well, I was in Tokyo and talking to the Japanese ministers about, you know, practicing the six paramitas and they all had blank faces and they had the expression that, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, that's our practice, right? We practice the six perfections uh, during Ohigan time. And they said, no, we don't do that. <laughs> and I did, that's the first time I found out. So that is an American Americanization of Shinshu. And that we don't, we, you know, we just take it for granted, but you don't find it in Japan. Also, the, the, the golden chain, that is not found in, Amer uh, in Japan. It was created in the 1920s or 30s in Hawaii by a Caucasian lady minister, you know. And it's probably, if you ask an ordinary Shin Buddhist in America, what do you, what do you know, tell, tell me about uh, Jodo Shinshu? And I'm sure that many of us will say the golden chain, even though some people criticize it. But um, that's another story. <laughs> okay, now. Um, so uh, I, I want to. Uh, so I talked about the organization, and now uh, what can we do in terms of teachings? What uh, what things can we emphasize? What things uh, can we, you know, tweak a little bit more to uh, to 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 be more palatable to American uh, acceptance? So um, this one is, you know, no brainer. I think the 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 emphasis on gratitude um, uh, is is one thing that we certainly can do. Um, the the advantage of gratitude is that it has it can be shallow, it can be very deep or very high. You know, Shinjin as the epitome of Shinshu spirituality has a strong element of gratitude, but you know, uh, we can feel grateful for the fact that, you know, our Temple basketball team won a basketball game and we feel grateful for that. I mean, that that's a kind of gratitude or, or a little bit higher on that maybe hierarchy is that, you know, our uh, grandson, uh, uh, you know, started to play soccer. So we feel grateful that he's healthy. I mean, so, you know, I think that people can relate to gratitude. Uh, for a long time, I used to kind of look down on gratitude as kind of like a folk religion, but I think that this is one way that people can relate to, and definitely uh, we should emphasize. I, I know that I know that in recent days, uh, you know, R Reverend Ken Akahoshi has been talking about that quite a bit, and I think that we should continue to emphasize gratitude. But Gratitude alone will not make uh, for a strong Shinshu spiritual tradition. And, 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 and the reason for that is that we have to have a much more of a solid spiritual uh, foundation. And that is, needless to say, Shinjin. And I, re I translate this, uh, I render it as Shinjin realization and entrusting. Um, you know, in my ocean book written 25 years ago, I translated Shinjin as Shinjin awareness. And it's basically the same realization, awareness, awakening, and which is not really emphasized in Japan. If you say to uh, someone in Japan, a minister in, you know, 
Fukui Prefecture, Japan, and say, you know, Shinjin Awakening, they probably say, oh, you're, you're Zen Buddhist, <laughs> you know. But I think that this part is definitely there, and I'll talk about it. And, and this has to be emphasized. It's not just simply, uh, you know, faith or belief. It's transformation. And then, of course, and then and the number one translation for Shinjin, as you know, is entrusting different forms like true entrusting. And so th that, is, that is important too. But I am against simply translating Shinjin as entrusting because it eliminates the sense of realization. And so kind of a little wordy, but I call it Shinjin realization and entrusting. And uh, so again, because it's a religion of awakening, not a religion of belief. And I'm gonna spend the, the, the bulk of the time uh, in the 10 minutes that I have to kind of uh, 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 propose some uh, em areas that we need to emphasize and uh, which maybe will not be in keeping with a traditional presentation. First one is just the one that I just uh, 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 informed you of is not merely a, a mere belief or faith, but in a godlike Amida. Um, there's an element of realization or wisdom as seen below. And here's a passage uh, from the, you know, his uh, Shinran's hymns. And it is by entrusting the wisdom of Shinjin. So Shinjin is wisdom. Of course, it's not my wisdom, wisdom from Amida, but it's wisdom. And he clearly says it. And then the question is now, well, that, Wisdom of Amida through Shinjin, does it manifest in myself? That's a question that traditional Shin Buddhists, I don't think, really address. But there is a footnote to this passage, and he says, Know that since Amida's vow is wisdom, the emergence of the mind of entrusting oneself to is the arising of wisdom. So he clearly says, Shinran says, that in oneself, there is a arising of wisdom. Of course, it's not necessarily your wisdom, but it's some wisdom that manifests. And so uh, that's the first point. Second point related to this is, is that Shinjin is, is on the third level of the three-stage process, as seen in the transformation through the three vows or the Sangan Tenyu that Shinran talks about. Um, uh, well, he doesn't emphasize this too much, but you know it's clearly there. And there is also a Zen metaphor of the mountain is a mountain on the first stage. Um, so let, let's. So my point here is that Shinjin uh, is the third stage, not the first stage. So the traditional uh, this well-known Zen metaphor uh, says mountain is a mountain. First stage. Second stage is mountain is not a mountain. And the third stage is mountain is once again a mountain. And Shinjin is at the third stage after you have gone through the process of the second stage. And so in the Shinshu sense that this transformation is expressed in what is called the three vows. Um, anyone studying Shinshu will know the 19th and 20th vows are not called the, not considered the ultimate vow, right? It's so I put this on the second stage, which is recite the Nembutsu, you know, maybe with a, almost a self, self uh, power attitude, but you are working on practice. Um, and in terms of the mountain metaphor, is to see that on the second stage, that, you know, you kind of analyze and 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 look at the mountain and see that uh, mountain is is a product of interdependence of soil, trees, rocks, pebbles, grass, streams, etc. And it's not so you kind of dissect and and analyze just like you practice and you engage uh, to improve, you know, transform yourself. But at the, at the next stage, the third stage, the mountain is again a mountain. Or in terms of the three vows, Shinjin realization and trusting. 
So uh, we are now able to feel a greater sense of oneness with its beauty and grandeur and for all the aesthetic and physical sustenance that mountain provides. And that is, is an element of Shinjin that we can all acknowledge, but it's certainly not the first level where you, you, people just, you just take it for granted, oh, it's a mountain, you know, mountains there. But after the process of transformation and after practice, um, you come to, you know, other power realization that there is this wonderful mountain that was that I didn't create, but it's there to provide the grandeur and the beauty and the physical sustenance. And so, Xinjin again is not a simple, you know, uh, folk religion faith or belief that it has undergone transformation. Okay, the third point is that I think um, because, as we talked about earlier, uh, Americans and Westerners are much more prone to want to practice. And then we have the six perfections, which are very Mahayana. And it has, you know, uh, selfless giving, dana, all the way to wisdom. And, and I think that this can provide a great framework. Of course, Already in BCA for many, even before the war, I mentioned the six perfections being emphasized, but you know, a four noble path and the four noble truth. These I think needs to need to be emphasized. Uh, in Japan, they don't. In general, they do not. And and that is why um, you know I think that's a whole other story. I think that in Japan, and I don't mean to criticize, but. Uh, you know, most people have been Shinbuddhists for generations. And what they want to do is to emphasize the uniqueness of Shin. And that's why you emphasize Shinjin. But you don't talk about the process. And I think that in order to, to come to realize your imperfections, you have to have a, a sense of an ideal that you're striving after. That's why I said earlier that even Shin Buddhism, the background is a path that Shakyamuni walked. And that has to be there in order to fully understand what, um, what Bombu means. Okay, so here, um, uh, so Shinjin, and I, I said that Shinjin is to realize, uh, uh, to come to realize is a realization. So the question is, what do we realize? And it's two things. This is based on Zendo, Shandao. And then two things. One is that I am a bombu, you know, and I, we can translate bombu in different ways. Uh, I, I just kind of said we are part of an interde interdependent network and we are imperfect compared to the Buddha, not compared to your next door neighbor. And the second is that I am embraced by the workings of wisdom and compassion of oneness, which we call Amida. So, uh, as you, some of you know, I like to play with words, and I'm proud of this one. The latest one is, this one mess is one with oneness. I, I don't know how you like it. Um, so, one, one mess, which is, I'm a bombu. Uh, I'm dependent on others. So one this is probably emphasizing too much uh, the, the the negative, but you know I think um, I think you get the point. But we are one with oneness. So this is another point that probably would be controversial if I were to talk about in Japan, even though I have talked about it. So far, I haven't gotten any criticism. It's probably because I've ignored. <laughs> uh, but when one becomes so, the question is. When do you know, I mean, we emphasize Shinjin so much that it's the most important thing, but we don't know whether I have it or I experience it or not. No one tells you. In fact, no one, very few people talk about it at temple, uh, right? Because when you talk about it, then people think you're being kind of egotistical. I think Renyo Shonin says, those who have it don't talk about it, but those who don't talk about it. 
So if you talk about it, people say, oh, he's just, uh, you know, uh, being egotistical. But I think that uh, it's uh, real, I mean, important uh, for Shinshu, if we're going to emphasize Shinjin, we have to be more clear what Shinjin is. And uh, there's no one answer, but, uh, and, and, and it's ultimately up to that individual. We don't, we don't have the ministers telling members, oh, you have Shinjin and you don't. They do that in some other traditions, you know, and, but we don't. And I think that's, that's a good thing. And, but I'm saying that if a person seriously seeks by, you know, attending lectures like this, going to Dharma, uh, Dharma talks and, and services, and 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 uh, study uh, practice the six perfections earnestly, and uh, then for a number of years, not just for you know one week or one 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 month or one year, for a number of years, sincerely without any you know ulterior motives, like you know if I go to church, you know I get a candy or people think I'm a good person. I mean we don't. That's not authentic uh, uh, motivation. But if you really want to learn. I feel that that person has realized one of the virtues of Shinjin, one of the benefits of Shinjin. So in a way, the seeking is an indication that you are within the realm of Shinjin. And I think that if you are of this, you, I think you can feel, um, you should feel confident that you, you are uh, you know, connected to Shinjin. Um, and I would even say, so I use this expression, realize the virtues of Shinjin. There are different virtues that Shinran talks about. You know, there are 10 virtues of Shinran, uh, Shinjin in this life. One of them is that you practice great compassion. You constantly practice great compassion. That is, Shinran says, is a virtue of Shinjin. So anyway, if you have, you know, uh, if, if you fulfill this, I think you should feel better about yourself in terms of Shinjin. The other thing is hardly also not talked about is that uh, Shinjin is equivalent to the first stage of awakening of Satori. And uh, it is a stage of the stream enterer and uh, stage of joy in Mahayana. So uh, this is a um, uh, part that is not emphasized very much. Shinran emphasizes because at these levels, you are no longer uh, backsliding, non-retrogression. And so uh, this is a very important stage in all of Buddhism. But Shinjin is, 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 uh, uh, corresponds to that. So it's not a folk religion. It's, it's the first stage of awakening of basic Buddhism. And that needs to be emphasized. Second one is that I want to emphasize uh, you know, we talk about birth in the pure land, but we really don't talk in detail about, well, how do you, how do you gain birth in the pure land? Obviously, you know, it's a religious tradition, so you cannot explain it rationally. But for someone uh, like myself and, and many people living in America or in the West, they probably, some may want to know, and I have found a passage that is very uh, satisfactory. That is in Kyogyo Shinsho, and he says that Shinjin is Goshiki, it's karmic consciousness. Okay. And then he says, he goes on to say that karmic consciousness merges with the name, the, the Milgo, and the light. The name and light, which represent Amida, you know, merges with karmic consciousness. So, and there is a passage here, so you can read it later, but it, you know, I consider that, you know, I, you know, one of the reasons why I became interested in Buddhism was my fear of death. And, and so uh, as I get older, you know, it's getting closer and closer. But uh, fortunately, because of my, you know, participation in the Dharma and the Nembutsu, I feel much better, in, I'm in a much better place than when I was in my 20s. And this, this passage has been very, uh, soothing for me because I know that my body will, you know, dis dissipate upon death. I'm no longer, but in this, uh, before the death, I am in a way embraced in the, in the name and the light of Amida. 
And then when death comes, my body will fall apart, but I will be one with Amida or my karmic consciousness will be part of it. So in a way, it's like the, uh, the, the Freddy the Leaf. It's going, you know, joining the great life. I'm already part of life. And then when I, when the body disappears, that I become part of Amida and continue to, you know, do what I can as part of this great a compassionate working to benefit others. And that's how I understand the returning phase of it, which is a, another issue to deal with. So here, if you take a look at this passage, uh, it, it explains in a way uh, how one is born in a pure land or born in oneness. And it's, it's something that is quite rational. And some, someone like, uh, like those of us who've been trained in, in a scientifically uh, 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 world that we can accept this. But you finally, the uh, uh, Shin Buddhist teachings provides a very viable teaching for this life as well as afterlife. So the image is that Pure Land Buddhism is only afterlife. It's not true. With Shinran, you know, he was actually within the larger Pure Land traditions. He was a revolutionary because with Shinjin in this life, he brought place greater emphasis in this life. But at the same time, he retained that tradition of life after death. So in many of many Buddhist traditions, even in Japan, whether you take Nichiren or Zen, they tend to be much more only this life. They don't have, in my opinion, a, a, a developed a doctrine or teaching of what happens after life, after death. And I think if it's going to be a religion, then that, you can't get away from that. But uh, I think Shin Buddhism uh, definitely has both. And that is uh, another point to emphasize. Okay, um, so this one, a questioner from one of you is that Jodo Shinshi really a Christian Buddhism? Well, you can, you know, spend, you know, the whole lecture just on this and, and the whole course uh, on this. But I, again, I mentioned this earlier, as a school of Buddhism, Jodo Shinshi is a religion of awakening. This is represented in its Shinjin realization and trusting is more in line with a tea ceremony, sado, flower arrangement, kado, and various martial arts, judo, aikido, karate do, that are based on sustained path of cultivation and maturation. These are all path, do, that involves cultivation, maturation, and transformation. I would add that, transformation. Seeker gains deeper realization over a sustained period of time dedicated to cultivation. So uh, uh, that's why I would not call Joro Shinshu uh, Christian. Of course, I, I don't want to make a blanket statement about what Christianity is, but I would say that at least Joro Shinshu uh, is a religion uh, that is much more a religion of awakening. Uh, well, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, when we do comparative religion, it's always dangerous because, you know, there's so many, so much, so many ways of interpreting and under appreciating uh, any tradition. So finally, uh, closing remarks: uh, Buddhism as a whole will fare well in the foreseeable future, especially those traditions with meditational practice. Second is that Jodo Shinshu can also fare well if the points made in this talk are fully implemented since they, in my view, point to Americanization of Jodo Shinshu. Many of these points are not new, for I am merely echoing the voices of many of my predecessors. The challenge is, as always, the ability to carry through these, through these ideals. The most important task at hand for each of us is to realize that, so uh, we're again caught in, you know, we know what we want to do or we should do, but we see the institution, the temples moving slowly and often maybe antithetical to what we want to do. So how do we deal with this dilemma? And so basically, uh, this is my 
response, the most important task at hand for each of us is to realize that that gratitude and, and should be based on Shinjin realization and trusting for myself and then do all that I can to share it with others. At least we can do that. Then I would have responded firmly to the call of Amida and to the opening lines of the tre three treasures. Heart is to be born into human life. Now I am living it. Hard is it to hear the teachings of the Blessed One. Now I hear it. If we do not deliver myself in the present life, when will, we, when will I ever realize it? May we all attain perfect peace.